Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Dan Attridge. I serve as the Dean of the Law School. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to our special event today. Uh, today's event is part of our Brendan Brown Lecture Series, which began at our law school back in 1982. Brendan Brown was the sixth dean of our school and was an internationally recognized legal scholar. This lecture series invites outstanding professionals from various fields who have made a contribution to public life to share their perspectives on a wide variety of current topics. On the back page of your program, you will find a listing of speakers who have addressed us as part of the Brown Lecture Series in previous years. Our special guest today is the Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, James B. Comey, Jr. In the interest of time, rather than detail for you his impressive credentials, I will simply refer you to the third page of our program for a description of his remarkable background and extensive experience. There you will learn more about his career in public service and in the private sector. Before I begin our conversation with Mr. Comey, I wanted to share with you a perspective on Mr. Comey that I obtained from Mr. Robert Stevens, formerly the CEO at Lockheed, where Mr. Comey was the general counsel. Mr. Stevens describes Mr. Comey as a transformational leader. To quote Mr. Stevens, Jim Comey knows that he must completely transform the FBI to meet the demands of the 21st century. No small task given the accelerating pace of global change. Fortunately, Jim is possessed with the skills and experience to meet these extraordinary demands. He has an exceptional intellect and a sterling quality character. He's genuinely honest and humble and good. He has demonstrated limitless energy and impeccable judgment in taking on seemingly insurmountable tasks and has delivered success after success with personal grace and unfailing good humor. There is no more able person to transform the FBI and to provide a positive, sustainable vision for our law enforcement than Jim Comey." End quote. Uh, we will begin today, but Director Comey is going to uh, give a few remarks on the topic of leadership, and then I will be following up by asking him a series of questions on a variety of topics that I think will be of interest to you. Uh, we're quite fortunate that he's willing to share his expertise with us. Please join me in welcoming Director Jim Comey. Thank you so much for that intro, which was uh, way too generous. You did find the letter my mother wrote about me, so I appreciate you reading it. Uh, what I thought I would do is just share some brief thoughts with you about how I and the FBI, more importantly, are thinking about leadership these days and why it matters so much. And then I want to talk to you about some of the essential elements of a successful leader that may be of use to you. My primary audience, I hope, is the law students here who are thinking about what they're going to do with the law degree they're going to get at this great place. First, how are we thinking about leadership at the FBI? We actually are focusing on what you are like more than what you have done. Because we've come to believe that what matters most in a leader is whether you possess a common set of attributes that will make you able to connect well with people, listen well to people, make sound judgments, and be a person of integrity, balance, and restraint. So we boil those attributes actually down to two twin pairs that seem contradictory, but they're not. Uh, kindness and toughness, confidence and humility. We're looking for people who are able to, to take that first pair, kindness and toughness, create an atmosphere where the people who work for them know they are loved. It's an atmosphere of mutual consideration, and I, I don't use the word love accidentally, but they are held to extremely high standards. Think about your own lives. If you're in this room, chances are you had at least one good parent. Think about the good parents you had, the good teachers you had, the good coaches you had, the good bosses you had. And I'll bet they were people who created an atmosphere where you knew they cared about you and they kicked you in the pants. Right? All of us are a collection of strengths and weaknesses, and I have uh, a long list, I hope, of strengths. I know I have a long list of weaknesses. One of my weaknesses, especially when I was younger, 
was an ability to convince myself that what I had done was awesome. Right? Just whatever it was, just dance away, drop the mic, yeah, nailed that. And luckily I was surrounded by people who said, no, it's crap. Right? No, you can write better than that. No, you can reason tighter than that. No, you can work harder than that. No, you could run faster than that. No, you could lift more than that. You could be more and you're convincing yourself and settling. And I'm a different person today because I was surrounded by people who did not let me convince myself that I was awesome. But that's only possible in an atmosphere of mutual consideration. Everybody gets that one without the, the other is dysfunctional in, in this sense. Toughness alone is obviously going to produce for you a horse that runs a few good laps and then having been whipped too much falls down and gives you nothing else. But I actually believe the reverse is dysfunctional and in many ways more cruel because kindness alone is a recipe for one of the great tragedies of human existence, which is unfulfilled potential, which is getting to the end of a career or a life and never having been what you could have been. That's what kindness alone will get you. Because it'll feel good, there'll be brownies on Wednesdays and cupcakes on Thursdays, and it'll be wonderful. And you will be able to fall into the trap that I would so easily fall into, that I'm good enough. And so we need both, kindness and toughness. And that's no small task, culturally, in an organization that relies upon the chain of command. Lives will be lost if the chain of command is not followed. In the FBI, in our operations, it's vital. But sometimes people can think, to be in charge, to lead that chain, I must be only tough. And kindness will be perceived as weakness. And that is a big mistake. And so we're spending a lot of time talking about that. You can be a nice person, which I think I am, and not a weak person. I am not a weak person. So that's the first combination. The second combination is the, the uh, confidence and humility combination. And this is a weird one. It's actually... Uh, maybe more important than the first pair in this respect. We're looking for people who are comfortable enough in their own skin to shut up and to listen to the people who work for them, to learn from the people who work for them. We're looking for people who are confident enough that they would rather be over there and watching one of their people shine, taking joy in the achievements of the people they've helped grow and nurture. The challenge for insecure people is they can't do that. Because insecure people can't be over there because it's threatening to have one of their people here. I'm lucky enough to have five children and to have married well above my station in all respects. And, and I was also really lucky to have great parents. And it wasn't until I went to sporting events with my five kids that I discovered a phenomenon that was alien to me. And it was parents competing with their own children at sporting events. And this dysfunction where a parent feels to be th appears to be threatened by the achievements of a child. The best parents, the best teachers, the best coaches, the best bosses feel best when their people become better than they. I think that's the measure of a great parent. You want your kids to be better whatever they pursue than you ever were, and that brings you tremendous joy. There's a certain confidence that's required to have that reaction. The other thing that being confident enough to be humble allows you to do is listen, as I said. And this is actually at the core of all leadership. The ability, communication is at the core of leadership, but the most important part of communication is listening. And here's why it's so hard to really listen. I guess I should define my terms. I, until I met my amazing wife and began a lifelong process of getting better, which is not done yet, uh, I thought there were two states of the world that passed for listening. One was something everybody gets is not real listening. It's what I call the Washington listen. It's a period of silence while you talk before I say why you're an idiot. It's the, it's the candidate sitting on the stool waiting for the light to go on to stand up and say that which they already planned to say. It's just your words actually reaching my ears, but they're not getting to my brain. Everybody gets that's not real listening. What I thought was real listening was that silence plus your words actually becoming part of my consciousness, that I'm actually perceiving what you're saying. I thought that was listening. What I've learned is listening is actually that period of silence, your words reaching my brain, plus something weird. By body posture, by face, by sound, me signaling to you that I want what you have. I need to know what you know, and I want you to keep telling me the things you're telling me. It's, have you ever watched Two Good Friends? Uh, 
talk to each other, especially, it's a cruel trick of nature that women naturally do this better than men, but men can be good at this. Watch two great female friends talk to each other. You could not transcribe it if you were a stenographer, because people are talking over each other, there's kind of weird sounds, like, uh-huh, and ooh, I know, and <laughs> sounds you can't even transcribe. <laughs> and what's going on there? They are listening to each other in a way that's pulling out of the other what's inside. Now, why is this so important in leadership? Because all of us are, are uh, deal with a phenomenon that I think is universal in human experience, and that is the imposter complex. And that is the notion that if you really knew me, if you really knew me the way I know me, you would think less of me. You would think I wasn't quite so fill in the blank. All of us have that to one degree or another, and if you don't have it, you're an unbelievable jerk. And so <laughs> I'm hoping that everybody in this room has a little bit of the imposter complex. Here's the problem. Because we all have it, it becomes a double bind in a communication between leader and underling. If we're going to have an effective communication, they're afraid of being exposed. And so I have to give them the comfort to know I will never hurt you. I will not expose you. And I'm the director of the FBI. If one of my underlings speaks to me, I could hurt them in ways that would last simply with a sound, just going pff, pff. And so I need to create an environment where they feel safe enough to overcome their imposter complex and take a chance with me. But here's the double bind part. I have an imposter complex. So to send them the signals with my shoulders and my words and my face that you're safe, I need to know what you know, what do I have to do? I have to confess weakness. I have to confess by the very act of listening in the real way that I don't know enough. And so that requires me to take a risk and overcome my imposter complex and Rick's being exposed. And so a leader, I think, has to obsess on this, that knowing that all of us are caught in this double bind, to be able to find out what's going on so we can all get better, I have to overcome my own and overcome that. And so I need to obsess on listening. And to be able to obsess on listening, to come back to where I started, I need to have enough confidence to be humble. And so we're spending a lot of time in the FBI trying to orient our selection processes, our mentoring, our coaching, our growing, and our evaluating of people to find these attributes that are more about who you are than what you've done. Because often in organizations you spend a lot of time saying, well, Sally tick these boxes and Joe tick these boxes, and you don't have the conversation go further than that. The conversation has to be, so what was she like in those roles? What did she show about her values and her abilities in those roles that would help us understand she's gonna be successful more broadly? Right. And there's something else at the core of good leadership that is a word used a lot but I'd like to explain why I use it a lot, what I mean by it, and that is judgment. The mark of a great leader, of a great lawyer, of a great anything, is that it is a person of judgment. Intelligence is the ability to solve a riddle, to master an equation, to nail a set of facts. Judgment is very different than intelligence. Judgment is the ability to orbit that answer, that set of facts, and see it as it might be seen through the eyes of others, or move it in place and time. What would that be like if it was over here, or if it was two years from now? How would it be seen by different people with different approaches to life? That's judgment. Intelligence is fairly common. Judgment is, in my experience, quite rare. I'm not sure exactly where it comes from. I think it comes from the way you were raised and making a lot of mistakes, and then learning from them. Say, oh, I did that. That really angered people. Okay, got to remember that. And eventually you develop the ability to orbit a situation. I actually think that I'm sitting in a place where you, whether you know it or not as a law student, you're actually learning the basics of judgment. Because what do you learn in law school? You're taught question assumptions, think about it differently if it was in a different court, a different time, if I changed a fact, if I offered you a different approach to it. You're actually learning, whether you know it or not, to orbit a situation, to orbit a situation and see it through different eyes, to see it through different biases and perspectives and see how it would change if it was in the Ninth Circuit or the Second Circuit. See how it would change if the law moved in a certain way. Whether you know it or not, you're actually practicing the mechanics of judgment. My uh, suggestion to you, request to you, if you're going to be great lawyers or great leaders is cultivate that. Be intentional about that. Because it requires more than just practicing with cases. It requires you to try and understand, so how are people perceiving this situation and me? And it requires something else that seems weird. Judgment is protected and nurtured by getting away from the work. 
by stepping away from whatever it is you're doing. That physical distance from whatever you're grappling with aids your ability to orbit a situation and see it with perspective and through the eyes of others. Tired people, people working too hard, have their judgment impaired. And I mentioned tired. I actually say this to the entire FBI. One of my expectations that either I deliver in person or is delivered in a video to every new employee is, I expect you will sleep. Sounds weird? Sleeping is not a moral failure, right? Sleeping is important for a whole lot of reasons. Among them, it's actually the neurochemical process of judgment. What's going on while you're sleeping? Right? Your brain is mapping and connecting and drawing inferences and helping you make sense of a complicated life or situation. And you arise physically refreshed in a way that allows you to step back to the work and see it in different ways. There is a great danger in lawyers and in everybody in the FBI, given the nature of our mission, that we will neglect that and it will impair our judgment. And there's one other thing that we risk neglecting. This is a part I suspect they tease me about behind my back. But another one of my expectations is I want you to love somebody. The problem with the work we do, right, we protect the American people is that you will convince yourself that I will get back to and fill in the blank. My children, my relationships, my parents, my friends, my girlfriend, my boyfriend, whoever it is in your life who are called loved ones, you'll think to yourself, I'll just get back to that because i got to do this thing. And lawyers do that a tremendous amount too. There's great get-back-itis in the legal profession. And the problem is, you really shouldn't have to tell people in the FBI that there's no getting back. Bad things really, really do happen to good people. And so you'll turn to go back, and it won't be there. And I have, as I said, I have five kids. I've experienced more than most humans the experience of a two-year-old running across the floor on unsteady legs to greet you when you come in the door. So I say to my people is, do not miss that. Right? It's the right thing to do, but it will protect you and nurture you and help you maintain that thing which allows you to exercise power responsibly, which is judgment. So I order you to sleep, and I order you to love somebody, and I don't want those two things connected, by the way. <laughs> so that's, that's how I think about leadership, the essential attributes of it. That's how I think about judgment, which is at the core of being great, no matter what you choose to do in life, and some of the ways in which judgment is nurtured and protected. And then I'll shut up after one, one other word. Uh, I'm going to speak tomorrow to a, a high school in Manhattan, a Loyola High School, where a nephew attends. And... And I'm going to be a depressing speaker because I usually am with kids. Uh, so I'll just get the one chance to talk to them and I'll tell you why. Um, what I say to young audiences is, look, kids, life is short. Bad things happen to good people. And they're like, oh my lord. Um, but, but I say to them, look, if all you do is live life forward, if all you do is strive for the next thing, which is really important, but for the good grades, for getting a good job, and getting a promotion, and getting a nicer house, and getting a nicer car, and saving some money, and getting a recognition, if that's all you do, there's a danger that you'll miss what matters. And so what I will urge them to do is to do something weird and depressing, is close your eyes and imagine yourself old and about to die. And you can see why I'm not a frequent uh, return speaker. <laughs> but I say, look, I hope you're old and gray. I hope I'm old and gray at that point. I'm at the end of my life. Close your eyes, look back, ask this question. Who do I want to have been? Who do I want to have been? And I tell them that the reason I tell you to ask it that way is from that vantage point, the smoke is cleared. Augustine said, human honor is but smoke which has no weight. The smoke is cleared. Houses, cars, money, plaques on the wall, honors, forget it. What matters will come into view. Who do you want to have been? And everybody's answer will be a different way, except I hope part of everybody's answer will be, I was someone who, with whatever ability I had, tried to do something to help people who needed me. And that's what the FBI is full of, people who decided that's who they want to be. You do not make much money working in the FBI. You will not get famous working in the FBI. But you'll be rich beyond belief if looked at from that vantage point. And so that's my advice to kids. That's my advice to people in law school who are about to graduate. I ache for a lot of my friends from law school who had a chance to do public service work, which is hard to do long term, but even to try it when they could have. Um, and I ache for them for how they're going to answer that question, honestly. And, and so my advice to younger people in law school and college is think about the answer to the question now and try to make that contribution that will make you, uh, Einstein once said, try to be a person of value. Uh, 
Uh, it will make you a person of value. You will have made a contribution that will be lasting. Um, and by that, uh, become richer than you could ever have imagined. So that's my spiel to you. You should merely run out and uh, reject the offers you got from <laughs> uh, But that's my pitch for you. And I think uh, you will be well served by the degree you get here. You're able to do so much good for people in this world. So I thank you for listening to me. Let me start with a couple of questions about leadership. Um, I assume that your leadership may have changed over time or adapted over time. You, uh, some people are born leaders. You may be in that category. Um, but even the born leaders do, do change. Could you comment on uh, maybe the lessons you learned and perhaps your, your leadership style, style changing, maybe from position to position or as you acquire more judgment? I think I was born, with, born and raised with some uh, some natural leadership uh, skills, that is I communicate well in particular and, and uh, think reasonably well, but I actually the biggest growth area for me was ego, that I thought I was hot stuff. And, and I'm, I'm, I've said to my wife, I give her all this guy's credit, chief, when we met, uh, I always say our journey is I made her a little bit tougher, she made me a whole lot nicer and better. Um, I. I don't think I spent enough time trying to cultivate this, the, the process of emotional intelligence and humility. And something I didn't realize, another, another piece of advice for young people, is I used to think that a reputation was the big things. And if you think of a reputation as like a prefab building, so imagine a crane lowering big rooms at a time. And then it's those big rooms which are the important meetings, the, the significant people I meet, the great presentations, that all of those were the things that sort of put together and created the mansion, which was gonna be your reputation. And it, I probably learned this in my early 20s, I think, that, that no, that the metaphor is right, that a reputation really is a, a mansion, but it's made of brick. And every single human encounter is a brick. Every single one. That, that there is no such thing as, I'll pick an important brick or an unimportant brick. Every human being, because what do people do? Everybody, what do we do better than, than, uh, than you might imagine? We talk about each other, right? like dogs. Whether you're in law enforcement, or academia, or at a club, you leave the room, everyone talks about you. That collection of conversations is your reputation. That reputation is formed by, so how did you treat people? And the, the challenge of that is, there's no play you can take off. The opportunity is, you can actually control how you interact with other people. So I think I, I became someone more conscious of being a nicer person, um, of not trying to pick spots and understanding that every person had worth and that, that if I embraced that, I would actually be, it would make me more effective, frankly. So I think that those are probably the two biggest journeys. I became a, I dealt especially on the ego side and I'm, I'm cultivating, trying to understand how do other people perceive me in a way I can't see, because that's the central, obstacles to all of our, any success, it's that I'm trapped in me, and right, I'm a tall, awkward white guy raised in the New York metropolitan area, and I was raised in a certain way, I experienced the world in this way, and I can't see it the way you do, but I can sure do a better job at trying to see it the way you do, in a whole lot of ways, and, and so that's the second piece I got better at. Um, reflecting on leadership, obviously you've had great success as a leader, and perhaps even an occasional disappointment. So first of all, would you uh, mind sharing with us what might be one of your prouder accomplishments as a leader? I, uh, I don't think I have one in particular. I think I have managed to cultivate environments when I've been a leader where people really did care about each other and have a lot of fun doing hard things, but in lots of different environments, I was able to create a family sense that people looked out for each other, and it actually made for more productive work conversations as well. That's probably the thing I'm, I'm proudest of, is being intentional about trying to foster that kind of environment. Um, flip side, uh, would you uh, share with us uh, uh, one of the bigger challenges that you faced as a leader and, and how you address that? I think early on, I used to avoid hard conversations. And 
And that would do a disservice to the person. Mm -hmm. right? But it felt easier to me. And it took me a while to, to grow up to the place where I realized that if I really care about this person, I will be honest with them. And I'll try and be honest with them in a way that is that doesn't damage them, because that's where emotional intelligence becomes important. But I think too often, early when I was a leader, I would just avoid the conversation and work around somebody. If I was busy, I just didn't take the time, and I realized that was actually selfish in the extreme, but that took some growing, really. Okay. Um, obviously, you've had a chance to meet many significant leaders from different walks of life, legal, political, business, and form some impressions about them. Uh, would you mind naming one or two notables and sharing your thoughts about their leadership? No, no way. <laughs> <laughs> you like to invoke the Fifth Amendment? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, but there are people, it wouldn't surprise you. I mean, one of my closest friends, and he's one of my closest friends because I think he is a gifted person and leader, now leads the DEA. He was my chief of staff, Chuck Rosenberg, and he was stolen from me to lead the DEA. Yeah. The reason he's a friend and the reason I think he's a highly effective leader is he embodies those attributes I talked about. And people can just feel it. The first time you are in a room and you're with Chuck and you work for Chuck, um, he really he oozes that servant leadership. And it's not faked. Right? He really is a person of humility. So he's probably the shining example today that I deal with. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let me shift over a little bit to public service. Uh, you've spoken of, uh, I, I, I read that you uh, spoke at the University of Chicago Law School uh, last October, and you commented that you chose you to start your career in government trying to be a part of something useful, which you talked about today, and you encourage law students to consider public service for at least a part of their careers. Um, I wanted to ask you some of the, the rationale behind your thinking. Uh, would you share with our audience your thoughts on why you found public service attractive and why you think our students should consider it? Well, in addition to what I said before, it's a ton of fun to do good for a living. As crazy as that sounds. It, and it's addictive, actually. Uh, in ways, I suppose money can be addictive, but money actually feels to me more like a trap. Being able to do something useful for other people, people who need you, is actually quite addictive. And I'll explain the difference. I... Um, when we moved, my wife and I, we had two little kids that moved from New York to Richmond, Virginia in 1993. She always hated New York. I couldn't get into the government because there was a hiring freeze. And so I went to a big law firm. As I like to say, they bought me matching furniture, which was totally new for me in my career. Um, and I had a parking space, and they, I became a partner, and they paid me good money, and, and interesting cases, and I traveled well, and ate on an expense account. And it was actually Patrice who noticed it first uh, because she said, I remember it vividly, she said, what's wrong with you? She says that in lots of different contexts. But she, said, <laughs> she said, what's wrong with you? We have this house. I even remember how much we paid for the house. Five bedroom colonial. We paid $252,000 for it. We've got good public schools. You got matching furniture, yada, yada, yada. What's wrong with you? And I said, you know, I actually think it is. Um, I miss doing work that has moral content. I miss, miss getting up in the morning, and, and my only obligation is to try and do something good. And I really missed that. And it left a hole. And so it was a difference between a job I liked, I liked working at the law firm, and a job I loved. And so three years later, I went back to the government, and the people at the law firm thought I needed a psych exam. Um, but they, most of them, had never done, felt that, tasted that in the same way. And so I, that's my, and it does, again, it doesn't matter, I'm not talking about being a prosecutor, being a defense lawyer, being a teacher, what, just doing something where your primary obligation is to do something for other people. And you make money secondarily, but your primary obligation, at least to you, should feel like I'm doing something good. And that will become addictive. And as I said, life is really short, and uh, you will be sorry if you don't seize that opportunity to get it. Let me uh, shift gears again and ask about the Apple litigation. I've heard of it. You've heard of it. <laughs> um, so uh, we've all read that the, the lawsuit uh, out in California with the, uh, uh, in which uh, Apple's assistance was sought to unlock the, the phone of the, the terrorists responsible for the killings in San Bernardino, that that's now been resolved. But we've also read there's another case, I think it's in New York, uh, where there's another Apple uh, a request to unlock a phone. I think it's a drug conspiracy case from what I've read about. But to the extent that you're free to comment, understand you may, may not be. 
Um, could you uh, share with us what lessons are to be learned from the Apple uh, cases? Yeah, I, I think there is one or maybe two. I don't think either of them is an FBI case. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. Of the, I mean, there are. I think there may be one in Massachusetts, maybe one in New York, but there will be plenty uh, because the nature of things is that this. The, the default encryption on devices is affecting all of our lives and all of our devices. And so by definition, it's going to affect the work of law enforcement in a pretty significant way. I think, the, I think there are two lessons from the Apple litigation. Uh, maybe they're, they're closely connected. The first is we can't resolve really important policy issues that involve our values and technology and innovation and safety and all kinds of other things in litigation. That litigation had to be brought, in my view, because that case had to be investigated in a reasonable way. That's what that litigation was about. But you can't resolve those questions in litigation. And so I, I'm glad the litigation is gone, because I, was, I think it was creating an emotion around the issue that was not productive. But I hope that, with the litigation gone, we don't stop talking about the issue. I just hope we start talking about it as best we can in a thoughtful, open-minded, informed way. And, and that's what I'm going to try to do. I, there's a problem, and the problem is two values that we all hold dear, safety and security on the internet and in our personal effects, and public safety are in tension. They're crashing into each other. And I don't know what the answer is, and I don't think it's the FBI's job to tell you what the answer is. The FBI's job is to say, hey, folks, the tools you're counting on us to use to keep you safe are less and less effective because of this collision. Mm -hmm. But I love strong encryption, love it, because it helps the FBI deal with a huge part of our docket, which is protecting privacy and fighting cybercrime. And for obvious reasons, I love public safety. And so what I hope is that everybody will engage in this conversation, because the way it should work in a democracy is the people of the United States should decide, so how do we want to resolve this collision between these two values that we all share? It's going to be hard. As I said, it involves technology, it involves innovation, it involves human rights, it involves international issues, it involves obviously public safety that we care deeply about. And so it's an incredibly hard conversation. It does not fit in a tweet. And so therein lies the challenge. Because today it's often hard to talk about something this hard. And this is, this is the hardest problem I've encountered in my entire government career. We have to find the space and time. We just have to. And again, I think the FBI's role is limited in that. I think the role of companies is limited in that. Companies' job is not to worry about public safety. It's not to tell us how we should govern ourselves. Their job is to innovate, to make great products for us, and to advance this our incredible country and its innovation. Our job as a people is to figure out, so how do we want to be? And that's going to be really hard. And so I just, my hope is that some of the emotion will come down and that people will as, as much as it's humanly possible, and it's very hard, open their minds. I gave a talk recently where I said, I hope we start from this place. I could be wrong. I could be wrong about the way I reason, the way I perceive, the way I conclude. I hope you could be too. And if we both start there, we can have a better conversation. And, and I'm keen to make sure people understand there's no demons in this. Apple's not a demon. I hope the FBI is not seen as a demon. We are people who share the same values. So my ask is we'll take the temperature down a little bit and continue to engage on this, because we have to. Because it's people keep uh, tweeting that how horrible it is that, that uh, I'm against absolute privacy. I don't think I've ever said I'm against absolute privacy. I just said, you know, we've never been there in the United States. We've never been in a world of absolute privacy. There's never been a widely available space in America that no judge could order access to. We've never been there. So we should never drift to that place. We should go there thoughtfully, weighing pros and cons and, and, and costs and benefits, but, but we shouldn't drift. Uh, because absolute privacy would be an entirely new thing in the life of the United States of America. And in my view, there's significant costs to that. And there may be significant benefits. As I say to people, I love privacy. I don't want anyone looking at my stuff. But there are significant costs if judges cannot order access to a space in the United States. So if, if not litigation is a solution, is this a place for Congress to take some action in terms of balancing these values? I'm sure Congress has got an important role to play, but, but I also think all of us should engage. I think academics should engage. Everybody who cares about those values, which I think is all of us, 
should get in the act and have a conversation. I actually think in one of the unintended benefits, I hope, of the Apple litigation is it's engaged people. And it'll draw more and more people into this conversation. I was excited. I went, I went out to Kenyon College uh, last week, I guess it was. Was it this week? It all runs together. Last week. <laughs> last week. Uh, to have a conference. And you know what? It was packed. There were, they told me there were 700 kids. It's a small school trying to get in. They, the overflow room filled. That's wonderful. And you know what? We actually had a very, very good conversation. Lots of people saw it differently than I did. But I spoke. They listened. They spoke. I listened. I responded. They responded. It was wonderful. If we can replicate that all over the place, we'll be better for it. So Congress certainly has a role to play, but I would hate for us to see something this important just say, that'll be handled over there. We all got to get engaged on it. Now, in the, the Apple California case, uh, I think some people who would come down heavily in favor of national security might have been quite concerned that the FBI couldn't unlock the phone to begin with. Um, or conversely, once you got the phone unlocked, the people who would be on the other side of the equation valuing privacy would say they're worried about that. How, how would you speak to those uh, opposite concerns? I think it perfectly illustrates the, the collision I'm talking about uh, and why this is such a hard problem, because I understand both of those impulses. Um, and, and so that's what I, I meant what I said, and I think, the, I think the president feels this way. This is a really, really hard problem, but it's not well served by being tweeted about it's not well served, in my view, by absolutes. Right? The people talking about we must have absolutely this or absolutely that. And it's not well served, I would suggest, by slippery slope arguments, which have driven me crazy my whole life. Um, and I said to kids recently, uh, college students, remember your philosophy professors call it a slippery slope fallacy for a reason. If someone says to you, if we do this, we will inevitably go down this slope. Well, it depends on what kind of shoes you're wearing, depends on whether you're on a, on a staircase, depends on whether there's a railing. And I said, so ask hard questions about that, because it's almost never the case that if we do this, this terrible thing will inevitably follow. It depends upon lots of choices and judgments along that slope. And so I, I hope people, this is a challenge, because there's a lot of emotion. And some of the emotion that, that, that I perceive around this issue reminds me sometimes, and the, and the absolutist and slippery slope arguments remind me of some of the rhetoric we hear in the gun debate. Here it's the same mm -hmm. kind of rhetoric and passion um, in this conversation. And I don't think that that serves uh, a good conversation. I really don't. And so I would suggest to people that we get rid of those kind of rhetorical devices and have a conversation about it. Um, and acknowledge, have some humility to know none of us has a monopoly on wisdom when it comes to this. And I'm trying to have enough humility to say the FBI's contribution should be limited. We should not tell people what the world should look like or what our tools should look like. We should say, here's where we are, here's how we think about it. Please tell us what you want our tools to be. Um, uh, you uh, spoke in November at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. Uh, I gave a very thoughtful talk about uh, what steps the FBI is taking to address cybersecurity uh, threats. And just for our audience's benefit, uh, Director Comey mentioned five specific things, focusing the FBI's efforts, trying to shrink the world by better deploying their people around the world and inside the federal government, trying to impose costs on the wrongdoers, trying to work better with your private sector partners, and trying to help your state and local partners be more effective. So those are the steps the FBI is taking. What I want to ask you is whether there's steps that those of us who are ordinary citizens or law students uh, should be taking to assist the FBI in your efforts to combat cybersecurity threats. That's a great question. I think those of you who end up working in institutions of any size should look to help us
and help them understand what was happening to figure out attribution and help them get back on their feet because we already knew them. Just like the fire department right, wants to get a general sense of a building so in the event of an emergency they can respond in a sensible way. We knew Sony well enough, again, not, not knowing the ins and outs of Sony's business, but the basics of who their key people were, who, what their key network um, attributes were so that we could help them. And so my, what I urge institutions to do is we're not looking for you to tell us anything secret, but you ought to familiarize yourself with us and we uh, with your general structure. So if we if there's an emergency, we can help you. That's on the institutional side. On the personal side, I would just suggest everybody understand how dangerous a place the internet can be. It's remarkable the amount of security that people will adopt in their own lives to go to a shopping mall that they will abandon when they're wandering around the world on the internet. And so the, the, they're probably you. You're going to come into contact with people who want to steal from you, who want to hurt you, who want to hurt your children. And so you should exercise the same care you would exercise in the physical world. A common example is people will click on attachments to emails that they should not click on. And what I urge people to do is if someone knocks on your door, you're never going to open your department door without looking through the people. And so if someone sends you an email, why on earth would you click on an attachment? without giving thought to, so who's on the other side of that door? And do I really expect this? And who are these people? And exercise that same care you would exercise in the physical world. And the other thing is basic uh, security protocol. Make sure your software is up to date. Make sure you've patched. If you have really important stuff, please make sure it's backed up. We're facing an epidemic, a viral epidemic of ransomware in the United States, and it's only going to get worse, of bad actors who are exploring, trying to find vulnerabilities to get into institutions and into people's uh, personal systems, to lock them up with strong encryption, and then try and charge you money to get it unlocked. And that is an enormous problem. One of the ways you deal with it is make sure you're patched, you have up-to-date software, so these crooks can't get in through a vulnerability. And second, make sure you've backed up your system, whether you're a person and it's your key photos, your keepsakes, or whether you, or you're an organization, and make sure the backup is not connected uh, to your main network. That seems pretty simple, but a whole lot of pain would be avoided by people taking those steps, which se would seem natural if this was the physical world, and what we got to get to is a place where they're natural in the world where we're all living today, which is in the online world. Uh, want to switch topics again, okay. Director? I want to ask you about policing and race relations. Uh, last year... At That's going to be all kinds of easy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the dean of a law school. <laughs> You think they ask me easy questions? Um, uh, at Georgetown, you spoke about these issues, and you candidly acknowledged what you referred to as some hard truths, which included law enforcement's unfortunate history of unfair treatment of disfavored groups, including uh, African Americans. And one of the mistakes you mentioned was the FBI's wiretap of Dr. Martin Luther King. Could you explain uh, for our audience the significance of the lesson to be learned about that particular episode? Yeah, we have driven this, the FBI's interaction with Dr. King, the wiretap efforts to extort him and to threaten him and all, all of that into our, trying to drive it into the consciousness of the entire organization and, and especially in our training. We have all new intelligence analysts and all new special agents in training visit the King Memorial and they take a course on this interaction that's designed to make them better thinkers about integrity and values. What I like about it is we don't teach at them. We talk to them about circumstances and ask them to say, what values do you see implicated here? And how would you say that's consistent with the FBI's values? We're trying to make them uh, better thinkers about these important issues. To me, the primary lesson we're trying to, to communicate is not to, to, to say, you know, J. Edgar Hoover was a bad guy or Bobby Kennedy was a bad guy, but instead to say, they were people. People are at their most dangerous when they're certain their cause is just and certain that their facts are right. And constraint and oversight is the answer to that aspect of our nature. We also have them go to the Holocaust Museum where they can see that example of what we are capable of on a scale that is nauseating. Uh, and, and so we're trying to teach constraint and oversight is necessary and important and if you find yourself in an echo chamber, you could do things because you've fallen in love with your own view of the world, your own facts, 
that are off axis from our values. And so you should welcome constraint and oversight. And most people in the FBI have heard this story now. I keep under the glass in the right corner of my desk the one page application that Jager Hoover sent to Bobby Kennedy in October of 1963, asking for permission to bug or wiretap uh, Dr. King. And it's five sentences long, and it's without really any factual, adequate factual basis. And, and it's signed by Jager Hoover, and it's signed by Bobby Kennedy, and then it's off. No date limitation, no place limitation, no oversight. And I keep it in that corner of the desk, because that's the corner of my desk where every morning, including this morning, I reviewed the request we're going to send in our national security cases to ask for permission to wiretap people in the United States. And those applications are as thick as my wrist or thicker. And I, I always tell my folks, it's a pain in the butt to get permission to intercept the communications of someone in this country for a limited period and all kinds of showings. And that's wonderful because that's constraint and oversight. It should be a pain in the butt. And I sit it there on top of that one page to sort of show the contrast and hoping that people will talk about it. They've heard about the director's desk and that'll further reinforce the message that, that we are dangerous uh, when we're unconstrained. All human beings are. Uh, another one of the hard truths that you mentioned was the existence of unconscious bias, uh, how someone from our white majority culture might react differently to a black face than to a white face. And to counteract this, you mentioned that the FBI works hard to design systems and processes that overcome these instinctive reactions. Uh, could you share with us any lessons that the FBI may have learned that might guide the rest of us in overcoming unconscious bias? Well, we have no magic answer. Uh, the, the, the best answer that we can think of is you got to constantly talk about it. And so we've driven it into our curriculum and training. And the whole Department of Justice is actually working on an effort now to train every single person in the Department of Justice uh, in, an, I think it's an eight-hour course on latent bias. And that is a great, that's necessary but not sufficient. We have to maintain it in the front of our mind because it, it's not that you have those latent biases, it's what you do next. And so there's an opportunity for the conscious mind to interfere with, with what the latent reaction might otherwise uh, produce. And so that means it has to be front of mind all the time. And so there's a longer story here, but we talk about it in training, talk about it in shooting training, talk about um, one of the important things that's happened in law enforcement um, is understanding the power of suggestion in identification procedures, for example. It's a great thing. I think it's nearly done across the country that we no longer use um, the spreadsheet um, and then we do sequential uh, photo identifications. Those kinds of things are part of constantly talking about the broader issue because it's not going to go away. It's part of the human experience. Uh, let me talk about uh, career advice sure. uh, for our students. Um, you've had a chance to work with many lawyers in your career in government service, in-house, private practice. Uh, could you describe what you think are the traits of the best lawyers you've encountered and conversely some of the worst traits you've encountered? I think the best trait, the best lawyers have what I talked about earlier, judgment, which is the ability, remember, to move in place and time. There are times when a lawyer is asked uh, to review a transaction or to approve the extension of something, and, and sometimes the stakes are very high. What makes the lawyer good for the client, which is when you're representing an institution, not the person in front of you, but the institution, is an ability to move in place and time and see how this will be seen five years from now or, or in, a, in a place where people aren't so, uh, there isn't so much urgency in the air. So that judgment is at the center of all successful lawyers. The second thing I think is at the center of successful lawyers is an understanding I used to describe it as the great lawyers are yes when it can be, semicolon, no when it must be. That they are people who come to understand their clients' hopes and dreams and try to become part of that venture. Not, not in, the, in the same way as the client, but to try and help the client achieve the goal. That's what yes when it can be means. Um, someone used to call uh, general counsel's operations the office of business prevention. Um, and when, when the job of general counsel or a lawyer for an individual is, you have a hope or a dream or a goal, I'd like to understand it so I can help you get there in a lawful, appropriate way. The other side of that semicolon is the break glass in case of emergency part. There must be non-negotiable. Non know when it must be. 
There are times when a lawyer is going to encounter, and maybe this won't happen during your career as a lawyer, but chances are it will happen at least once, you're going to encounter a goal that cannot be lawfully accomplished. Either the goal is inappropriate, or there is no lawful path to the goal. And it's then you have to step to the right side of the semicolon and say, look client, no, not now, not ever, can't be done. And that's really hard, because often you're alone, there's tremendous economic incentive leaning down on you, right? Imagine you're a young associate at a law firm or you're a junior partner at a law firm. Think of the pressure brought to bear on you, almost never explicitly, but brought on yourself by this, this is an important client of the firm and they want to accomplish this thing and I'm going to say not only no, but not ever. So you have to think about that in advance and understand, so what kind of lawyer am I? Yes when it can be, semicolon, no when it must be. And you can't ever let go of either of those pieces or you'll be lost. And of course what will happen to you is, in the future, when there's a hearing, a congressional hearing, a court case, you're going to be alone. Because right? the client's going to say, she told me this was okay. She, oh, I didn't tell her what to say. Or, or he said that, oh, what do I know? The lawyers, you will be alone except with you will be the reputation of the institution you represent, the reputation of this entire profession, which has internalized the rule of law, and you will have betrayed that, and you'll have done it entirely alone. No one will remember that everybody else is in the room with you. So the reason, remember I talked about judgment, the ability to travel, that ability to go to the future and realize I'm totally screwed, um, will help you understand both sides of the semicolon and give you strength. Uh, mentoring. Uh... You've touched on some thoughts about relationships with, with others, but wonder if you might have some advice for our students about the best ways to go about forging and maintaining a successful mentoring relationship. Yeah, this is an interesting one. I, I think official mentoring relationships are important. But I actually, so that is where you set up that so and so is my mentor, and so we meet once a week, that kind of deal. But I actually think a different kind of mentoring is more valuable to you, and that is find people that you admire and whose work impresses you and, and copy them and study them and watch them. And if you get a chance to talk to them, great. But you'd be far better to sort of laser in on someone who you want to be, even if you don't get to have lunch with them once a week, then spend lunch once a week with someone who was in the mentoring pool, she got matched up with them. That's, that's important stuff, but this is actually more important. And then the other thing is, um, I would advise you to avoid um, trying to be seen. That, that is saying, I'd like you to mentor me. Instead, uh, be great. Right? People notice. Right? I can see talent, and I especially look for talent that doesn't try to show me that it is talent. And I want to see people who have enough humility that they're not racing up to me after something, saying, will you be my mentor? Instead, they're doing great work. And I actually always try and look past that, that crowd that's in front of me and see the, the woman who's sitting there doing great work or the guy who's sitting in the corner who impresses me, and I seek them out. And so my first piece of advice to you would be just be great. And, and the work will shine. People will notice and they will seek you out and try to be connected to you. And, if, and they will react a little bit to the, I'd like you to be my mentor kind of thing. And you may see them looking over your shoulder for the people who have more humility than that or a little bit in the shadows. That's a weird way to think about it, but I think that's consistent with my life experience. Uh, I want to uh, wind up with a couple more okay. personal questions, if I might. So uh, we're at Catholic University, obviously, today. And I understand that you're uh, a Christian. So this prompts me to ask you about your thoughts about Christian values uh, in, in the legal world and your career in public service. So uh, could you comment on what, if anything, is the relevance to faith-based values to a lawyer or a public servant? And, uh, and for personally, for you, how your faith may or may not have guided you in your career? I hope those of you who are, are, are look at the world through a faith lens of any kind um, already saw in the things I said the themes of that faith. One of the cool things about college for me was I was, a, I was a chemistry and religious studies major. And so I got to, I got to study New Testament, Old Testament, um, things in the, the tradition I've been raised in, but also study other faiths. And what's interesting is um, they all have the same core values that I just talked about. Humility 
an understanding that people are deeply flawed, and an effort to offer perspective about what matters in life. That the things, the human honor, the cars, not only are, don't matter, but they obscure what really matters. And so and that understanding that I'm deeply flawed, that you're deeply flawed, and starting from that base of humility, understanding that, that, and that sense that we're all the same, or we're all in a bad way, um, will make us care about each other more, and that sense that those things of the world are really not that important will give us the perspective to pursue work we actually love. And so I think that I see that in the teachings of Jesus, I see it in Islam, I see it in uh, Jewish traditions. It is, those are constant values in people of faith. And I hope you saw, those of you who see the world through, I aspire to have those values reflected in the way I talk and act. I'm, as I said, I'm a collection of strengths and weaknesses. I meant what I said, understanding that people are flawed is really, really important. That's all parts of life, and, and I'm no exception to that. Uh, one last question, if yeah. I might. Uh, you mentioned that your wife and you, you are the parents of five you know, children. Uh, you've obviously had heavy demands on your time due to your career responsibilities, and I wonder if you might comment on how you've managed to have some semblance of work-life balance in your own career. Um, I'm about to give her a shout out for the third time, I think. Um, Patrice taught me this, and she used to beat it into me. Uh, not physically, thank goodness. <laughs> but she used to say, you don't want to work for anybody who won't respect you for the value you place on your family. And she said, you ought to test them. And if they don't like that, you do not want to work there. That's the first thing. The second thing was, she was this, if you were here, she'd kill me for telling you this, but she had this uh, fill-in-the-blank sentence where whatever role I had, especially as I got the so-called important roles, she would say, if the, and then fill-in-the-blank, director of the FBI, deputy attorney general, United States attorney, can't be at their kids' read-with-your-kid day, finger-paint with the second graders during the day, be at their kids' ball games. who can be, right? She said, you need to model this for younger people. You need to be the person I urged you to work for when you were younger. And so you know, that uh, really, really helped me, is that I, I just developed this attitude that if people aren't going to respect me for the way I am, and I really did, I was there uh, for my kids. I'm not a perfect father, but I fought to be there. And then I could work after they were asleep, but I didn't miss ball games. I, have, I still don't. And so it's, uh, it requires a fight, which is what I tell my workforce. You must fight for it. But I, I, that's, that's the lesson that I've, those two lessons have tried to, uh, to be part of me. And here's the other thing, you know, especially working in so-called prestigious jobs, uh, big law firms and stuff, there's a ton of goofing off that goes on. Um, and so, if you are an efficient person, here's what, I wasn't a great colleague, I almost never went out to lunch. Still don't. I eat my lunch at my desk. Not that I don't like people, I said, I want to go home to my wife and my children. And so I would be very, very, very efficient and not do so much hanging out and, and uh, fooling around, which, you know, I miss some of that, but I put a higher value on, I will get home and I will read to my children. I did it uh, nearly every night, and I would try to schedule travel in such a way that I could uh, do it in, in the tightest period of time. But it, it, look, that requires a fight, but that is essential. It's essential. I don't regret a second of it. Um, I'm a very happy person because my family's at the center of my life. I know my children. I'm very close with my children, and I want to know their children, and God willing, my children's children's children, and then I'll be a happy person. Thank you so much. Please join us. The director needs to uh, leave us for obvious reasons, and with his detail here, term that I assume I wasn't about to argue. Um, but the rest of you are welcome to join us in the atrium. Continue reception. Thank you so much. <laughs>